Good evening. Good to see each and every one of you here tonight. Aren't you glad that whosoever meaneth me and you tonight? Praise God. I'm so glad for all that he's done for us. It's been a good day in the Lord, and I trust it's been a good day for you. And that song, All Day Long I've Been With Jesus, has kind of been going through my mind today. And uh, it's just good to, to be with Jesus. And it's good to be in his house tonight. Why don't you stand with me and let's invite his presence to come and meet with us tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the help that you've been given in these revival services. And even last night around the altar, we praise your name. But Lord, this is a new service and we're giving it to you tonight. You know about every detail and we're trusting it in your hands, Lord. Be with the Hillagosses and Brother Mitchell tonight as they minister to us and may we open our hearts. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you remain standing as Brother Hillegas comes to lead us in our singing? Amen. Turn with me to song 467. You've been a good crowd and you sing. I love it. So let's sing together tonight again. Amen. And sing and sing to the Lord. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I gain. Turning back now to song number 503. This old song has been sung so many times, but I so thank the Lord that it's still real. Holiness unto the Lord now and forever. So let's sing it then tonight.
I am so thankful for it. Uh, God's presence and to know that he's real. Praise his name. This next song says, "We I have settled the question. Do you remember when that happened for you? Do you remember when it took place in your life? That you settled it all. You finally said yes to Jesus and everything cleared up. And I'm so thankful I remember the day when that happened. An old-fashioned older prayer to know that Jesus paid it all. Praise his name. Let's sing it tonight then. Song 399. I remember.
Amen. Let's sing that third verse again. the holy joys that always last and rejects his pleasures that send me past I won't invest I've settled the question forever I have settled the question hallelujah I will never Whatever others do, Brother Rex, give us a testimony. That third verse speaks about the choice that we have. Um, and, you know, there are pleasures in sin for a season, and I don't understand why sometimes it seems like you can be going along and everything's good and there's no temptations, and next thing you know, you know, it just seems like temptations all around. Um, but when it comes to those points, those times in our lives, I'm glad that we can look back and say, you know, I have no interest in going that way. Right. And uh, God's just told me just recently Amen. several times of, of heart temptation. But, I, you know, I've just turned to God and said, you know, I have no interest. You know my heart. Praise God. Uh, I have settled the question. I'm glad Praise I have my God. Amen. That's good. Maybe someone else. Quickly, before we sing, I'm going through number 170 in the chorus book. And these new course books have that verse that I wanted to get in there. So I'm so excited about that. This is my testimony tonight. You know, the world is bidding. The world is fighting. And even much of the church world has gone a deplorable direction. But I'm so glad you can have it settled in your heart. I'm going through whatever others do. Let's sing it together. I'm going through. I'm going through.
tonight. Praise God. Anyone else? Right here. And sometimes when we walk with Jesus, people may not always understand the decisions we make. And I was thinking about this uh, story that Max Licato wrote about a bunch of little wooden people that would walk around with a box of stickers. And they had these stars that they would stick on you if you did something good and dots if you did something stupid. And just kind of like the words we say to each other. And then one day this little wimmick that all he could get was dots. He meets another girl and she has no stars and no, no dots. And, and he says... How do you not have any stars or any dots? And she says, well, I, I go to see the wood carver every day, the one that made me. And I'm so thankful that I find my value in the one that made me, and I'm free from the dots and the stars of this world. I'm his, and he's mine, and I love Thank him. Thank God. Amen. Anyone else? Word of praise on your heart tonight. Thank God. Yes. Good. Good. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's so good to be free. Number 212 in the chorus book. It's so good to be free. <clears throat> it's so good to be free. tonight. Amen. We're going to have a special number in song. You go ahead. Amen. That's right. That's right. Amen. Anyone else? Quickly. Praise the Lord for these good testimonies tonight. Brother Black. Amen. Amen. Thank God. It's good to be free tonight. Praise the Lord. 
Amen. The Lord bless the singers as they sing tonight. Have you started for glory and heaven? Have you left this old world far behind? In your heart is the comforter dwelling. Can you say, praise the Lord, he is mine? Have the ones that once walked on the highway gone back? And you seem all alone Keep your eyes on the prize For that home in the skies God is still on the throne God is still on the throne And He will remember His own Though trials may us and, and burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone. God is still on the throne, he never forsaketh his own. His promise is true, he will not forget. Does it seem that your path is more thorny as you journey along on life's way? Go, Go away, away and in secret before him. Tell your grief to the Savior alone. He will lighten your care. For he still answers prayer. God is still on the throne. He is coming again, is the promise to the disciples when he went away. In like manner as he has come from you. Does his tearing cause you to wonder? Does it seem he's forgotten his own? His promise is true. He is coming for you. God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. us and burdens distress us he never will leave us alone god is still on the throne he never forsaketh his own his promise is true he will not forget Well, that's a good song to go right into prayer with and uh, believe that God is on the throne. Brother Black, would you come to the platform, please, and prepare to lead us in prayer? We are praying for this week of revival. We're praying for the Gatlinburg IHC that is happening in just a few days. And then, of course, we're praying for each of the physical needs that have been mentioned, Gary Basim in the hospital, and then other needs 
And then those families that are grieving, we've been praying for the Kara Plank family, Bill Devaney family, Mervyn Royer family. And last night during the service, Melissa Jean Hoover's father passed away. Wish you would really pray for Nelson and Melissa, that God would comfort them in this time of loss and uh, that God would continue to answer prayer. Glenn Ritchie's dad came through the surgery well today for which we're thankful, let's continue to pray for him. How many are carrying a burden for someone on your heart a spiritual need, God knows what that is. If you're able, would you stand for prayer tonight? Brother Black is coming to lead us. You pray with him. Almighty God, Praise the Lord. I think of those songs that we just sang, dear Lord. I have settled the question, dear God. We think about this revival service, dear Lord, and we think about the power of God to move. And we think, dear God, about how that you can settle down and Lord, there are those out there in this audience that have never, never settled the question, dear Lord. And we want to feel the power of God descending upon this audience, Lord. And there will be those here that will just deep down inside. Lord, we don't need another emotional touch. We want the emotion, yes, Lord. But down inside, we want to see the set of the wheel that says, I will go through with God. I'm going through. And Heavenly Father, we're pleading and praying one more time for thy power and thy reviving power, dear God. We think about IHC coming up, dear Lord. And Heavenly Father, without you, we have absolutely nothing. But Heavenly Father, if you will split the skies, if you will rend the heavens and come down and give us an outpouring of the glory of God, it is something that can change lives and transform people and give them exactly what they need, dear God. Heavenly Father, we come before you as desperately needy people, needing the touch of God in a spiritual power, needing the moving of the Almighty God. Heavenly Father, there's those among us that are not well. There's those that are suffering loss. There are those that have come to service tonight burdened and heavy. And yet we know that thou art the God of all comfort and that you know how to put your big everlasting arms around people in the middle of heartache and help us to recognize that those who've gone to heaven have gone to a better world. And though we may be separated and feel sorry, Lord, we know where they are. There's others, Lord, that are facing physical difficulties and problems, but the power of God is capable of taking everything and working it out for your benefit. And we just simply, in the middle of all that, we believe God. And Heavenly Father, would you be with this group tonight, dear Lord? Give us of thy divine help. You know the burdens of each one. We want to see thy miraculous power in healing, Lord. We want to see thy miraculous power in saving souls. And we want to see thy miraculous power coming down and touching the hearts of people. And we're asking for it tonight in thy name. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Black, for leading us in prayer. The ushers are preparing to take the offering this evening. Thank you for your generous giving throughout these revival services thus far. And we're trusting God to continue to help us. Thank the Lord for his presence tonight. Amen. Amen. It's so good to, to be in his house this evening. Let's pray over this offering. And uh, Brother Boyd Day, would you pray over this offering tonight?
We look forward to a wonderful day tomorrow. It's Good Friday, 2.30 p.m. communion service here. Brother Mitchell will be speaking. The Hill Gosses will be singing. It'll be a special time, 2.30 tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow night, it will be a regular revival service here. There will be a youth emphasis in the sense that some of the young people will help with the service. And then after the service, the other pastors were panicking. I invited all of you to the Bates Center, but I wasn't supposed to invite all of you. It's a youth night, and youth, teens, and young people are invited after the service of the Bates Center for a time of fellowship. And um, so I do apologize to the youth pastor and all of those who panicked over my announcement last night. Um, but uh, do keep that tomorrow is going to be special. Then Saturday night, 730, and then Easter Sunday. I've been inviting people all week long to be here on Easter. We want to fill the church and most of all have a great service. Of course, early in the morning, join us at Mount Pisgah Altar at 630 for the sunrise service. Then, of course, Sunday school at 9 and at 530, and then worship services at 10 and 630 don't miss Easter Sunday and be inviting people to come. Uh, I also would just ask uh, Nelson and Melissa Hoover, of course, are in Arkansas. Her, her father passed away last night. And I wish you'd just really surround them with your care. We're not able to be there with them. Uh, but uh, if you have a way to reach out to them, I know it'll be much appreciated. We want them to feel the love of their church family in this very difficult time. We've sure appreciated the ministry of our evangelists. The Hillagosses will sing. Brother Mitchell will bring the evening message. Let's just keep our hearts open. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I know there's many distractions, but you on purpose chose to be here, and I want to say how much I deeply appreciate it. And God has been so good to favor us with his presence, and I trust he'll continue to be here uh, through the remaining portion of the service. Thank you for that beautiful singing. God is here to help us tonight, and we appreciate everything that's being done to make our stay here wonderful. What a lovely meal we had tonight in the, 
the parsonage with the goings. And it's so nice that the church owns the house there and has two parsonages in the same building. So lovely. And uh, no, I'm just teasing. They don't really own it. But I wish they did. And maybe we ought to raise money tonight and buy that house. And then you could have another pastor. And just add another one on. And maybe, maybe Brother Plant could get everything done around here. Uh, and not have to scold them all so much. But anyway, let's look to the word of the Lord. I've got uh, some notes here for myself tonight. One of them has two big eyes on it. It says, stay focused. So uh, my wife said, now remember... Uh, what you're supposed to do. And I said, honey, I've got it written right here. Two big eyes says stay focused. So let's stay focused. Psalm 124. Uh, I don't go fishing for my sermons. My sermons jump in the boat with me. And uh, I keep a, a, a notebook beside my chair and just every once in a while, uh, a sermon will just jump out and land in my boat. And I'll just write it down, any thoughts that God would give me at that time. I keep all that with me. And today, the Lord said, I want you to use this one that jumped in your boat a couple weeks ago. Didn't have an outline. I got home from the Goings house. I had an hour and a half to church. And I told my wife, I said... Stop me wherever I'm at at 7 o'clock. I'm going to go with it, whatever I've got. And so I got done at 5 till 7. This is a new sermon. Never preached it. Have no idea how long it is. I got to get started. Psalm 124, verse 7. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your great mercy, your help to us in the service, and we ask now that you'll come and meet the needs. Lord, there are people watching all over the world tonight, and they're not with us in the service, but they're at home in their living room, and you can help them there. They're in the hospital bed, and you can help them there. They're at work, and they got their phone on. They may not ought to, but it's on, and they're watching. I pray you'll help them there. Others will come home from their revival and they will get on and watch Beaver Town's revival tonight before they go to bed. We pray you'll help them, encourage them. Some will find the service much later on an archive somewhere. And we pray at that moment you'll use this truth to help them and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, I want us to notice tonight our soul. Our soul. How do you value the soul? There was an infinite price paid for your soul. Your soul is not redeemed with silver or gold or corruptible things, but by the precious blood of Jesus. From the very first moment that a baby draws its breath, that little soul enters into the world and thank God uh, for the breath of God. When every newborn babe makes its cry, another soul has entered into life and has a lifetime ahead of them to mind God or become an outbroken Christ rejecter. They have a choice, the soul. The immensity of the capabilities of the soul are staggering tonight. There's the capability of the soul to, to uh, go through intense suffering and immense trials and tragedies and yet by the same token the soul is capable of great joy and an unmeasurable intensity of joyousness in God there are fountains of joy that spring up you know uh, Webster said it right when he said joy is a sp deep spiritual experience you know, if you ever lose your Bible, if the communists come and take all the Bibles or they finally quit printing all the good Bibles and start selling the trash, I just want you to know, pull down, pull down the Webster Dictionary and if you read it, you can get to heaven. Webster says joy is a deep spiritual experience. <clears throat> As long as the soul attains to the high 
proportions that God has desired, many things may be enjoyed. The soul is the breath of Almighty God. From the dust of the earth, my God created man. His breath made man a living soul. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and that is why I love him so. I was made in his likeness, created in his image. I was born to serve the Lord. I can't deny it. I'll always walk beside it. I was born to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. His breath made man a living soul. I may talk about that some other day, but I'm going to go on here now. It is the candle of the Lord that lights the soul of man. Within every soul, the candle of the Lord lights that soul. It is the masterpiece of creation, the soul of man. It's stamped with the very likeness of God. The soul has an intrinsic value. It's immortal. It's a flame that can never be extinguished. It is unseen. You cannot see the soul of a person, but yet it's eternal, and your soul will live on forever somewhere, either in the great realms of heaven or in the terrible regions of the damned in hell. Your soul will live on forever. The grave possibilities of the soul. I want to look tonight at Mark chapter 8. We'll just turn over there real quick and read a couple of verses. The grave possibilities of the soul. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, there's a possibility you can trade away the very thing that God breathed into you and made you a living soul. God never intended for any soul to go to hell. If you go to hell, it will be because you've waited through the blood of Jesus. It will be your own choice, the soul. The scripture here tonight in Psalms 124 says, Our soul. Not only do I want us to notice our soul tonight and its intrinsic value and all the capabilities. If we had time, there's two hours worth here. We must hurry on. I notice also the fowler. The fowler. The fowler is mentioned here. The fowlers, the snare of the fowlers. Who is the fowler? The fowler is the old devil himself who uses every contrivance known to man. He sets up traps and snares to capture the souls of men. Fowlers are setting traps and snares to capture birds, to put them on the table. They will kill them. They will drain out their blood and they will put them on the table somewhere. The fowlers, they are the killer of birds. They're the trappers of birds. That's what fowlers do. The fowlers in the Bible had several ways that they would catch the birds. And I, I don't know if you've ever uh, made a snare or not, but in Indiana now it's illegal to catch animals with a snare. But years ago, when I was younger, it wasn't. And I had an old fella in my church that taught me how to set a snare. Uh, we, we would catch rabbits. We caught sometimes <laughs> possums. We didn't know what we were going to get in the snare. But I'll tell you what, we'd go out and check the snare, and there'd be something good in there, there'd be something bad in there. But there, he showed me how to build this thing. And actually what it is is several pegs driven in the ground, and one of them is called the key peg. And uh, when that uh, bird, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to trap a pheasant or, or some other edible bird that you like to eat on your table, uh, when he goes in there and brushes past that trigger, that trigger snaps 
and that snare falls down and traps the bird. If you're wanting to catch a rabbit, you set the, you set the pegs all around and put a rope and pull, pull a young sapling down and tie it there and, and place that rope under the trigger peg. And when that animal goes in there to get the bait, that, that, that thing will turn into a noose and go around that animal's neck and that young sapling will fly up in the sky and that animal will hang there and it'll be there when you go pick it up. How many have ever set a snare? I see some hands. It's, it's something we don't do now. If you do, you go to jail. I'm glad I had the experience because it helps me understand how this intricate little thing works. There's always bait involved. There's always the trigger, the trigger peg that makes the thing go, that causes the trap to fly, that causes the noose to be drawn, the fowler. The old devil has been snaring people for thousands of years. Do you really think you're any match for him? Do you really think you're slick enough to get the bait without being snared? Satan desires to set a snare for your soul. Proverbs 7.23 says, As a bird hasteth to the snare. It seems that some people are just prone to the snare. It seems like some preacher's kids are just prone to the snare. All their lives you bring them up and you take them to camp meetings and, and they meet all the best workers and the best workers in the world eat at your table. They go to all the camps. They go to all the youth camps. They're around family members that are holy people. And all through those years, you feel like you're doing what you need to do. You feel like that you're doing everything you can do. But there is something deep within the heart of some of those kids. Uh, they feel like they are able to get past the contrivances of the devil and slip in there and get those goodies that their parents have protected them from their entire life. And they do it. They go as a haste. They go in haste to the snare. It's amazing how quick people go to the snare. And you don't have to be a kid to do it. I have seen adults with the glory and glow of God on their face. People that I thought were a Joseph, character speaking, and I watched the light go out in their eyes. And I watched them as they drifted out into the night. And tonight they're in a snare somewhere. It's an awful thing to watch. There's nothing really pretty about an animal hanging from its neck from a young sapling. It's a little bit disgusting. But if you like to eat rabbit, it's not such a bad thing. There's something disgusting about the snares of the devil. Disgusting to me. Filthy and disgusting. But people are going in haste, according to Proverbs 7, 23. The, the devil's been snaring souls for thousands of years, and yet you think you're so clever and your personality is so slick that you're going to get in there and get that bait and get out without... Flipping the trigger pig, peg. Do you really think you're going to be able to do that? Do you really think on your own that you are a match for the person who was able to talk a third of heaven's angels away from the throne room of God and cause them to fall and be lost for eternity? Do you think you have a chance at outsmarting him? You're headed for capture if you do. 
don't head toward the bait. I'm just telling you right now, and I know a lot of the young people are involved in something at the school tonight, but I just want to tell you, a lot of people have something in their pocket that's going to cost them their soul. Listen to me. One night I was in a church, a big church, and several young people came to the altar, and one of the boys got up and screamed like he'd been shot. And he pulled his phone out of his pocket and he looked toward the crowd. He was crying. He was wailing. He said, folks, this is going to send me to hell. And he threw it down on the altar and poured himself over the altar like hot water and just melted and wailed and cried. It, something on that phone had a hold on that boy. I didn't go down and ask him what it was. I don't need to know. I don't need to know, but something got a hold. And I want to tell you, we've never lived in a world like we live in now. Don't think you can go for the bait and not be caught in the snare. Oh, boy. The Fowler, he's, he's in the story. I wish there wasn't a Fowler in the story. I wish I could tell you that all the kids that I'd pastored hadn't come in contact with the Fowler. I wish that I could tell you that all the folks that were at the altar the same night I was when I was a kid are all still shouting the victory and they didn't, they didn't come in contact with the Fowler, but they, they did. There's still several people. I got to honestly say this. There's several people that were at the altar the same night I was that are still shouting the victory. Some of them are pastoring churches. I was just in a patriotic service this summer, and one of the boys that was at the altar with me is the sheriff of that county, and he's still shouting the victory, and he's pastoring that local church. I say hallelujah. Oh, I'm glad some of us avoided the snare. The fowler... I notice also tonight the fowler's bird. You see, after you are caught in the snare, you are no longer your own. Before you were flying and free, but now you are property of the fowler. You're the fowler's bird. What and how you end up is all according to his will and his plan. He's caught you in spite of all your cleverness. He's watched you carefully as you came closer and closer to the bait. And with a smile, he said, it won't be long. You are in the snare now and you are awaiting death. Your soul's going to live on forever. And if you're in the snare, you're in the outer courts of hell right now. Are you listening to me? If you're in the snare, you're in the outer courts of hell waiting to be called because you are the fowler's bird now. You've taken yourself out of God's hands. You've fallen for the bait and you're the fowler's bird. You're setting, awaiting your death sentence. You're on death row. Nothing seems more hopeless to meet people that have been caught and caged. They've been bound by their habits. They've been bound by their lust. I tell you, we've never seen a day where more children are disappearing. And they're going, they're being sold into white slavery. They're being sold all over the world to become somebody's slave, sexual slave. It's an awful thing. Keep your kids close to you. Monitor where they're going. Keep an eye on them. Don't let just go into the mall and turn them loose. Horrible things are happening. People are bound by sexual lust, heinous sin, and some bait has drew them in. 
One lady set a trap for her own husband. I just read this. She felt her husband was cheating on her. And she decided to pose online as some other person. So she posted a fake post. And her own husband answered her post thinking she was another woman. And this went back and forth and back and forth for weeks. And finally she said, I think I'm ready to meet you. And when he came to the point of meeting, it was his own wife. He, she had caught him in a snare. He was looking for love and had been talking to the one already that he had, thinking he was searching for the one he really loved somewhere else on the Internet. But when he came face to face with her, he realized that he had fallen in love with his own wife. That would be interesting. <laughs> so aren't you going to finish the story? No, because I don't know how it ended. <laughs> I'm not forgetting. I just don't know. Kind of glad I don't. If you're in that snare, your soul is Satan's right now and you're his captive. Second Timothy 2 says it well. And I'm just going to turn over there and read it to you because I can't, I can't say it any better than 2 Timothy says it. 2 Timothy 2, it says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You become at the will of the fowler. You've been taken captive by him when he willed. You thought you were the master of the deal. You thought you were the slick one. You thought you were the smart one. No. You became captive at his will because you surrendered yours. It's terrible to see people that have been caught and caged. I visit prisons all the time. It's an awful life. Some never leave. Some are killed daily. Prisoners are killed right in prison, spurting blood all over the beds. Killed for a snack cake, a radio, a pair of shoes. They're in there like animals. The guards are even afraid to go in. They look through the glass, and after the murder is over, they lock the place down and go in and drag the dead out. So does that happen? It happens. It is happening right now because people have been caught in the snares of the devil, and they are captive of his will. I notice also tonight there's hope. You've been waiting on that. The broken snare. The broken snare. Psalm 91.3 says, surely. That means without a doubt. Absolutely. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Psalm 91, 3. Hallelujah for that promise. Do you want to be delivered? The promise is surely, surely, surely. The songwriter said, and it's in the old Nazarene hymnal. I sang out of all three of them tonight. He, uh, when he announced I've settled the question, I just grabbed the old one. I knew it was on 359. I didn't know what page was on the big hymnal. I didn't know what page it was in the chorus book, but I knew what page it was in the little hymnal. So I just reached and grabbed it. I've been singing out of that since I was a little bitty tiny guy. I know about all the numbers. I just shout whenever I hear him announce the number. <laughs> Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. 
Hallelujah. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver. Though by sin oppressed, come to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. And then I want to notice not only the broken snare, but the escape. How is this escape accomplished? It's accomplished by the broken snare. You say, well, you just talked about that. Well, not totally. There's more. I don't give away all my secrets at once. 2 Timothy 2.25 tells us how the snare gets broken. There's a way to break the snare. In meekness, instructing themselves, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You see, some people just seem to be their own worst enemy. They oppose themselves. Everything they do just puts them in deeper. Every, every decision they make just makes their life worse. I saw a girl walking down the road the other day. She was rather rotund. And she had her hair dyed red, raggedy and red. She had several big tattoos. She was poured into a pair of thick pantyhose. That was her, that was her slacks. It was sad. She thought her feet were her best feature. She had every toenail painted. She thought her feet were her best feature. Sadly, that was true. <laughs> and I said to my wife as we passed her, you know what, really? Get that red hair out of her hair. Cover those tattoos. Put some shoes on those feet. Put a nice, modest dress on that girl. Arrange her hair attractively, she might look like an old fashioned holiness lady underneath all that. We need to pray for these people. They think they're making themselves look better, and the devil says, Yeah, this is going to look better. Get, some, get your ears bigger and bigger. Make the holes bigger and bigger till they look like pretzels. Yeah, get more tattoos so when you look old, and your, your skin all gets wrinkled. It looked like somebody's playing a blue and white accordion. <laughs> Just do it all. And people fall for that. They think this stuff's making them look better and it's really making them look worse. My wife gets compliments all the time. Even when she's not dressed up, people say, oh, your hair is beautiful. And by the way, it's not a hair piece she has on. That's her real hair. People say, oh, Sister Mitchell, where do you get your hair pieces? Give me a break. This is real hair we got here. <laughs> it just happens to be darker on the ends than it is at the top. I don't understand it either, and I see it down all the time. I don't know. I've got, I've got all my rabbit trails, Deborah. I'm sorry. Back to the message. I want to tell you tonight, there are two things that will trigger open the snare. God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. The two things that cause the snare to be broken are repentance and acknowledging the truth about your life. You acknowledge that you have sinned before God there's a better way to live, and you repent, truly repent. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. It won't take five altar nurses to get you through if you really repent. Hallelujah. I went up to a kid one night. He'd been right here in Pennsylvania, been to the altar every night, 12 nights. And I'd been down to pray with him just like a wet noodle over the altar every night. I couldn't get nothing out of him. He wouldn't answer me. So finally, on the last Sunday night, I said, look up here at me. I said, you come over here and drape yourself over this altar like a wet noodle every night. Now, what in the world's wrong with you? So I talked to him. Sometimes you've got to use the rough approach. 
After 12 nights, I'd had it with them. I'd had it with that kid. I couldn't get him to answer me. He wouldn't do nothing. I'd go over and pray, pray till I was sick, and I couldn't even get him to raise his head, snort, answer, nothing, just draped. And I got a hold of his little head. Have, have you ever just wanted to take your loved one's head in your hands and look and say, is there anybody in there? <laughs> this kid's 12 years old. I said, listen, do you honestly think that you have done a sin at age 12 that's so bad that God won't forgive you? I said, the biggest sinner has already been saved, and it wasn't you. It was the Apostle Paul. He said he was the chiefest of sinners. He's already been saved. So quit hanging over the altar and act like you're the big thing. You're not. He's the chief, and you're just a little powwow Indian. Don't even own your own tent yet. <laughs> quit putting on a show. I said, listen, buddy, you need to get down to business and pray. Boy, he got down to business. I had his attention. I had his face in my hands. You're not going anywhere when I get you with this grip. <laughs> and I began to pray with him. I said, this boy thinks he's the worst sinner, so I'm going to pray with him like he is. And I hung that little dude over hell for about 30 minutes. I told God how rotten he was, that for 12 nights he'd come to the altar and couldn't find God. And you know what? In a little while, that little dude got interested in praying. And you know what? He got, he got saved that night. He might be here. Come and introduce yourself to me. You remember the night I got a hold of your little face and looked to see if there was anything inside those eyes? You've got to repent. It's the trigger switch of breaking the snare. Hallelujah, it works every time. It's a working tonight. Repentance and acknowledging truth. No, honey, you're not going to get to write your own Bible. This is the one. This is it. It's the one that's going to be on this side of the scales in eternity, and your life's going to be over here, and it's going to be weighed by this Bible, not yours, this one. The snare's broken, and we are escaped. Woo! We've escaped our addictions. We've escaped our carnal nature. We've escaped our jealous eye. We've escaped our lying spirit. We've escaped our lustful eye. We've escaped our dark passions. We've just escaped. Hallelujah, that's an abrupt ending. That's all there is. We've just escaped. We were prisoners of the fowler just a moment ago. But admitting that the Word of God is truth and repenting, flipped the trigger switch, the snare came open, and the bird says, I am getting out of here right now. You know, there's nothing like seeing somebody in altar prayer that says, I'm ready to get out of this mess. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm ready to get out of this. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Come and play some I'm going home music, will you? I call it exit music. It's actually called postlude. Let's stand. Do you feel good about being out of the snare? Oh, I remember the night God let me out of the snare. Let me tell you something. I was raised in a Nazarene parsonage while they're getting ready to sing, play the exit music. 
And uh, I, I went to school with another Nazarene preacher's boy who was, uh, he was, he was a bad boy. He's probably watching tonight. Hi. And he was a bad boy and he knew how to cuss. I'd never been around anybody that cussed. Now, my dad, when I was real little, would, but I was so little, I don't remember a lot of it. I remember some, but dad would only do it when he was really, 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 really mad. And usually when he was like that, I made my exit. But this kid could cuss. I mean, he knew words I'd never heard. And he'd say, he said, you want to learn to cuss? He said, we'll go out at recess and we'll cuss. So I went out at recess and he cussed and I cussed. And he cussed and I cussed. I learned how to cuss. Boy, it was, it was absolutely astonishing. And then I'd go to church on Sunday night. Brother Palmer would preach. The Holy Ghost would get on me. And I'd run to the altar and, and get freed from cussing again. And then my dad bought a car from an old man named Red. And he had a real gravelly voice because he'd smoked his whole life. And he put his feet up on his desk and he said, Max, this Buick's going to make you a nice car. And I went home and I said, oh, i got to be red. I rolled up little paper cigarettes. I'd go out to, the, out to the hog houses, way out from the house with my paper cigarette. And I, I'd put my feet up on an old hog trough and I'd say, Max, this Buick's going to make you a fine car. And I'd come back to church the next Sunday night. Brother Palmer would preach, and I'd get under conviction. I went to the altar every Sunday night for years. That's how I lived. I lived that way. I was a sinner all week long when I was with my friends. I, I couldn't, I, I wanted to be with God. I love God. I, I love the church. I love the shouts. I sat on the front seat, but I was in a snare, and I was only nine. But one night, God broke the back of sin in my life. On a hot August night, I got all the way through. And it's been working ever since that night. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, you don't have to be old to get in a snare. I remember the next day after I really got through, my mean little friend, the Nazarene preacher's boy said, what you want to do? Let's cause some trouble. He said, what can we do today to get in trouble? We did it every day. We, we would hide things. We would cause turmoil and trouble every day. What are we going to do today? Let's get our heads together. I said, listen, I'm done with that. I got saved last night. He said, ah. He said, we're going to have some fun. I said, you're going to have all the fun you want. I'm done with it. And I've been done with it. Years later, God brought him back into my life. I was pastoring in church, knocked on my door one night, soaking wet. He said, Raleigh, mommy strode me out again, his wife. He said, my clothes are laying all over the front yard, pouring down rain. He said, would you take me over to help me get them? We went over the garbage bags, picking up wet underwears, wet T-shirts, wet jeans. I mean, she had thrown his everything he owned in that front yard, and it was all wet. We had three or four garbage bags of wet clothes. He come back to the parsonage. My wife washed all the clothes and, and folded them, and he spent the night on the couch, and he said, Raleigh, take me home. He said, I think Mom will let me in this morning. So we bagged up all the clothes, and he slipped up to the door sweetly, and she opened the door and threw her arms around him, and he motioned to me, and I carried the clothes back in. But that's how they live. I haven't heard lately whether he's in or out, whether his clothes are wet or dry. I don't know how it's going. All I know is I got freed from that at nine years old. Exit music, please. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs>